Some people love Tom King's run on Batman, others hate it. I wish it was that straightforward for me. With Hoof. Hey guys, it's me Marcus, aka The Mad Dog, and we're back with another video. Written by Tom King and illustrated by a plethora of artists, the first issue in this one of Batman was published by DC Comics in August of 2016, with the 85th and final issue being released in February of 2020. So literally this ended and then the world did the month after. And Bruce Wayne has a death wish. With the arrival of two superpowered beings declaring themselves to be the future of Gotham, Batman will have to figure out where his place in this new world is. In between an Arkham Uprising being led by Bane, a war of both jokes and riddles, and Catwoman being there for every step of the way. What will be left of the Dark Knight when all is said and done? If you couldn't tell from the length of this video, I do not have a clue where to begin this review. It's not the length of the run that's the issue, because I reviewed all of The Walking Dead with no problems. It's more just the inconsistent quality that comes from King's Batman. Maybe you're watching this in the hopes that I end up bashing it, or hoping that I can defend it from all the criticisms, but it's just not as simple as one or the other. But fair warning, this review is so back and forth that you might feel like you've got whiplash. And to make it easier, I've split this into parts in case you want to skip to a certain section, and because I don't shy away from any spoilers, you may want to avoid that. So, the first thing that jumped out at me from issue 1 is that this felt more like The Dark Knight Returns Batman than it did any other from the regular continuity. Like, I'm not sure why it was leaned on so heavily, but why did Bruce seem to actively want to die? This was being released at the same time as Tinian's Detective Comics run, and Batman seems fine in that. Well, as fine as a guy who fights crime dressed as a bat can be. But a plane might be crashing into the ocean? Well, let's just grapple hook onto it and say our goodbyes to Alfred. Like, don't get me wrong, this isn't a completely left field turn for Batman, the guy has been through some shit in his years, but from the very first issue it's there on the surface. The first chance Bruce gets and he's gonna punch his own ticket, but the problem is that it's not consistent throughout. I'm gonna try and connect it to a theme throughout this video because it does crop back up here and there, but in those early issues I found myself wondering if it was King alluding to the fact that when there isn't a big threat in his life, Bruce just doesn't see it as worth living. But if it is, then that idea isn't fully fleshed out. If anything, it felt like that opening scene on the plane was just a plot device to introduce two new characters, Gotham and Gotham Girl and by god were these two dull, and really lazily named. It's disappointing since this is the opening arc, but I just did not care what the mystery was surrounding them, or how they were thrust so heavily into the spotlight. And even when the Justice League got involved, it only minimally boosted my excitement. Like yeah, I've heard people in the past say that Gotham is pretty much as big of a character to Batman as some of his rogues gallery, but King didn't have to take that literally. So I can't lie, out of the gates I did not have high hopes for this run, because there's a plethora of established Batman characters that are so vast and diverse verse that you really need to have a good justification for throwing in two new ones, especially because they were pitching them as the next evolution of what Batman started, but it just never really felt organic. They've got the same mission as Bruce but the powers of Superman, which seems like it could be a good storyline, but it just never felt that interesting to me. Don't get me wrong, on the surface of what's still some good here is he tried to get to the core of what makes Batman Batman, and he's trying to show these two newbies the ropes, but it felt like it was treading the same water that we've seen before when other characters joined the Bat family. And I don't know what's worse, the fact that this storyline was the opening, leading me to believe that these two would be integral to the entire run, or the fact that they're pretty useless after the opening story arc. Was this like some kind of editorial interference thing where someone came by and told King that he just wasn't interesting enough? Or was it part of his plan that we just had to endure, you know, like preheating an oven when all we wanted to do was eat? But either way, we got to see some fun bat gadgets and big action scenes that the more grounded Batman stories often avoid, so it managed to avoid being a completely boring story and still set the tone well for what was coming, and I just love David Finch's art, so even if I was a bit confused, at least I was looking at something pretty. He always brings that big scale energy, the action always has oomph, the double page spreads are phenomenal, and I just love what he does, and I wish he was on more projects. Unfortunately though, we then go into one of my least favourite Batman stories in recent memory. Night of the Monster Men. I spoke about this story when I reviewed Tinian's Detective Comics run, and the pointlessness of the whole thing was so fresh in my mind that I kind of skimmed over these issues. To give it some credit, it's not as jarring here as it was in Detective because of the connection to Hugo Strange and the setup in the issues before, but I still didn't enjoy this, and if you want to hear more of my thoughts on this storyline, then I'd recommend checking out that other review. It's just a shame for King that things went from meh to straight up bad, because if I was reading this in single issues and I didn't know what was going to be later on in this run, I probably would have dropped this altogether. And I was trying to figure out King's objective or overarching theme of this run so that I could do this as a video essay. 
Nazi, similar to what I did for Zdorsky's Daredevil. But in the broadest sense, I think what this boils down to is Batman finding his will to live again. So we talked about at the start with the Kamikaze Batman, and I think once Catwoman enters the picture, it makes a lot more sense with this idea in mind. Because their relationship carries throughout this entire run and always finds a way to connect back to it. It doesn't feel like an afterthought, and although there are some hiccups which I'm definitely going to touch on, it was the main element of this series that really got the time they needed. So if you're the type who never really backed them being together, then avoid this run like the plague. But I quite liked it, and it's why I felt that the run picked up quite a lot after the Gotham arc and Monster Men were done. Brazenly titled I Am Suicide, and also pretty much guaranteeing that this video is going to get demonetized, there was a ton to really enjoy here, and it corrected a lot of the problems that I had with the first two story arcs. Admittedly, it took me a few issues to trust King again, but from the moment that Selina's brought in, the tone of the book feels more focused. And there were even great little moments sprinkled throughout, like Batman actually being the world's greatest detective to realise that someone was pretending to be Gordon. The team they assembled was fun too, it wasn't just a regular Suicide Squad so that they could springboard another series. Although even with saying that, I don't know if this spun off into anything. We played to the strengths of this unique cluster of characters. I wished Bronze Tiger had a bit more of a presence, but the pairing of Catwoman and Ventriloquist is one I would gladly read more of. But there was something odd that I noticed with the art during this arc. Mikkel Janning takes over it, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, there's no disrespect intended if I didn't. And the majority of it is great and reminds me a bit of Frank Quietly, and it is quite a welcome change because the majority of this was taking place outside of Gotham, so to have a bit of a different look, something that was different from Finch, made a lot of sense even if I am a fan of both of these. But there'd be these double page spreads that had a pulling layout, and there'd be a handful of them throughout this run, and I don't know if that comes down to the penciling, or maybe just King scripting, and it didn't feel intentional or that they were trying to be deliberately confusing, but instead that it was just poorly thought out and things like that were just frustrating. It's odd though because with just a few small changes, I feel like this would have been a much better introductory arc, mainly because of the Catwoman stuff and how important that was for the rest of the series, but also because it's where Bane makes himself known. He is the villain for a number of key parts of this run going all the way up until the end, and because King introduced him so early on, it made him such a formidable foe and gave credence to the plan he'd been planting the seeds for early on. And because a lot of the stuff in the first arc didn't make its way into the rest of the run, it's even more confusing that King didn't decide to start with this storyline when so much important stuff happens in here. And I have to give a special shout out to part 4 of I Am Suicide because this was one of my favourite issues of the entire run, where it's just Batman going through an army so that he can get to Bane and it solidified the tension between the two. There is a ton of history between them and King does a good job of tapping into that rather than just trying to make this his own. Again, this might be me looking way too deep into it, but Bane breaking Batman's back was a time where he had to find the will to live again. So having it be Bane and a run that is helping Batman find a reason to keep on living again feels like a wise choice. As well, King did a good job of connecting the overarching plot because it's only with Catwoman's help that Batman initially manages to get away from Bane. And it carried over into the future arcs, especially with I Am Bane. There's a few issues in between these two arcs where Batman and Catwoman contemplate what the next phase of a possible relationship could be. And one of the single most annoying style choices, if I'm going to be polite, rears its ugly head in this part of the run and refuses to leave. It's that irritating double talk. The irritating double talk? Yeah, the irritating double talk where people just repeat what the last person said. People just end up repeating what the last person said and it always feels like they're mocking them. Yeah, it feels like they're mocking them, so I don't get why they're always doing it. Yep, that's how annoying it is. And who knows, maybe this is going to be one of those things that I remember is happening way more than it actually did, but Every time this happened, I rolled my eyes and skipped every subsequent dialogue bubble. I get it, it's supposed to be cute and fun when Bat and Cat are doing it, and when the two characters aren't in the same conversation and it's mirrored scenes like some of the ones with Bruce and Clark, those were the moments where it worked quite well, but other than that, it felt like King had a word count that he had to reach, and this was the easiest way to do it. As well, there's also this running joke that's introduced here, where they talk about whether they met on the street or on a boat, and again, it's one of those things where at first it's fun, but it just really overstays its welcome. Like, I thought it it might have been a nice tongue-in-cheek joke about how continuity has always been reset, but this is an 85 issue run and this one aspect of their relationship just really doesn't keep me interest for that long. But yeah, those issues were placed in between the two Bane story arcs and I feel it should have either had no time between I Am Suicide and I Am Bane or given it even longer. That might sound like the nitpickiest of nitpicks, but the placing of the story arcs is something that I'm going to touch on throughout this review. It also takes away a bit of the shine from the second Batman vs Bane fight, despite the fact it was brutal and carried 
across a few issues. I went back later and checked this out on its own, and it is a fun story arc, but it's just positioned bizarrely in the grand scheme of the run. And I think if we would have had I Am Suicide at the very beginning, and then maybe I Am Bane a little bit closer to the middle of the run, and then concluding with the stuff that we got with him, it would have felt like there was a real three-act structure there. And as well, it just made it seem like Bane isn't as calculating as I first thought, and instead is more like the Xenomorph from Alien Isolation. Which, yeah, saying it out loud, that sounds like something I'd really want. And in a further example of the confusing structure, the button follows, and it's one of those aspects that has aged horribly now. Sure, it brings the Flashpoint Batman back into the picture, which was something I was initially excited about, but that got less and less the longer that he was in the run. And I may be the only one who was bothered by this, mostly because I often get told that I talk too fast, but how were full conversations happening within the space of a second? These panels are clearly supposed to be a second apart, but just look how long the sentences are. Is this even possible for Bruce? Like, I get it for Reverse Flash, but is Bruce's one superpower super speech and everyone just forgot to tell me? Did he have prep time for this conversation? So because I get accused of talking quick all the time, I thought I'd give some of these panels a try. I have set my timer to one second, and we're just going to see if I can do any of these panels where Bruce is speaking. So looking at this one at 28 seconds, we've got Get Out My Cave. Get Out My Cave. Okay, just about did that one. Yeah, I don't know how I changed the ringtone. Gonna give it another go. Get Out My Cave. I'm hoping that's now a copyrighted song. Next one that we've got, and again, it took Bruce one second to say, we've got, yeah, that's right, but you know what's also right. Okay, feel like I've got to prepare for this one. Yeah, that's right, but you also know what... I'm having another go at that. Yeah, that's right, but you also know what's... Third time lucky. Yeah, that's right, but you also know what else... No, I just can't do that one. Even longer than that, in the very next second, so, you know what, I'm gonna make this a bit more interesting. I'm gonna give myself two seconds, because that's how long Bruce had, and sometimes that's as long as I need. And I'm gonna try and do, yeah, that's right, but you know what's also right? When you blur, you can't stand ready, unless something solid's touching the ground. Apparently, Bruce said that in two seconds, so let's give that a try. Yeah, that's right, but you know what's also right? When you blur, you can't stand ready. No. I'm only having one more try at this. Yeah, that's right, but you know what's also right? When you blur, you can't stand... It's impossible. So yeah, maybe I'm being a bit harsh on this small crossover. It was fun seeing Batman go up against a different character's rogues gallery. That's something I've always enjoyed, and it's not going to change here. But I hate when it feels like a book only exists to promote another storyline and now that doomsday clock has been and gone and if i'm being honest i can't remember much of it anyway despite reviewing it this doesn't add much to king's overall story even if it is a fun crossover with williamson's flash i do wonder as well how this will read in the upcoming omnibus of williamson's run which if you wanted to pick that up and support the channel at the same time you can get it for a little bit less with the discount codes that we've got with the channel sponsor organic price books they've got great packaging fast shipping and amazing customer services and if you use code woof woof you'll get two dollars off your order and if you're ordering three or more books and you want them to be delivered together make sure you use code woof woof ship it together for five percent off your entire order don't worry you can just copy and paste them from the description down below and you can use these codes as many times as you like So after the button and a fantastic team up story with Swamp Thing that unfortunately didn't add much to the overall run, King moves into the next phase of the story, but once again there's some fantastic highs and disappointing lows. Straight away we get Batman's proposal to Catwoman, and I remember when this news broke and people were divided on it, but I think both the concept and execution of the moment is great here, especially because there have been a few story arcs re-establishing their romance and reminding us of the history that the two share. It makes a lot of sense and I'm also a fan of trying to take a character to their next logical destination. Sure, it's Catwoman, so even though I've seen her more as a hero than a villain, part of me was wondering if this was the next long con for her. But especially given how just 20 or so issues earlier, Bruce was willing to surf a plane into an ocean of certain death, it felt like the character had a new motivation and reason to keep living. And I was excited for the possibilities that this could bring. For all the faults I might raise about King's writing during this run, he managed to make their connection feel human and genuine and build it outside of the scope of them being two heroes or former enemies. Maybe it was just me and a of course he had the benefit of history, but I wanted these two to make it work this time, and I think the proposal happening quite early on in the run was a smart choice that had been set up well. But something else that had been set up well yet still managed to fall at the first hurdle was the War of Jokes and Riddles. By god, talk about snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. There had been tons of hints and people within the book talking about this war. The presence of the Joker and the Riddler was there even when they weren't physically, and just the concept of it sounds too big to fail. But where was the war? This went on for a good number of issues 
news, but all we got was narration of what had happened and an ending. There were a minimal number of scenes showing us how things unfolded and having us on the ground there whilst everything was going on, and I don't understand why King chose to do this as a flashback because it removed a lot of the excitement. It felt like I was reading the tie-ins, but somehow it skipped the main event. Actually, even worse than that, the recipe for a great story arc was all here. Two fan-favourite villains going up against each other, with the main hero caught up in the middle, the rogues gallery split in two and choosing sides, all the while alluding to the fact that our virtuous main character did something so abhorrent that they even struggled to admit it. So why couldn't King pull it off? This could have very easily been Civil War meets No Man's Land, and considering the build-up from the start of the series, we should have been at the centre of the war and we shouldn't have missed any of this. If that means having a different perspective other than Bruce's, then fine, so be it. We're not beholden to his viewpoint just because it's a Batman book. The framing of it left too much to be desired as well. Like, am I just an awful person, or did Bruce act like he'd done something way worse than he actually had? Actually, don't answer that. And sure, I get the promise Bruce made, and it would have been far more impactful had he held a gun rather than a knife, but it boils down to, he almost did something but was stopped. Am I just being Mandela affected, or has that happened a few times throughout his history? Did he not try to kill the Joker during Hush? Or after Jason Todd was killed? Why was it made out to be such a grave error here? Was it because it was against the Riddler, or because it was a Joker who stood in his way? Or maybe was Bruce just being a bit melodramatic? All I can really tell you about this war was that there was a five day battle between Deadshot and Deathstroke that I really wanted to see more of and be in the centre of it. Kite Man somehow stole the show, Bruce Wayne hosted a dinner, and there was a showdown in a boardroom. I know I'm going in on it quite a bit and it might seem like overkill, and I want to stress that this wasn't bad, but it really fell short of what it promised and reiterated that problem I had with the Bane arcs. Why give us a proposal just before? For this. That opened the door for a ton of storytelling potential that then had to be paused whilst Bruce tells his seven issue story. It would have been so simple to solve this anyway. Just have the big proposal at the very end of this story arc. Maybe I'm in the minority there, but he just highlighted the stop start nature of the storytelling and it's as if King just couldn't get out of his own way. The war with jokes and riddles had all of the ingredients to be great, and despite there being some fantastic moments, it left me feeling frustrated. But if I am trying to be somewhat neutral and respect what King may have been trying, having the war be a story that Bruce tells Selina positions it as a caveat to their engagement, as if two of Batman's greatest villains and the mistakes Bruce made with them is something she will have to accept for them to be together. So perhaps there was something deeper going on behind this structuring, but it does weaken the impact that a bigger storyline like this should have had. But I can't move on from this storyline without going back to one character. Kite Man. How did they make me feel for this guy? There was a page where he was narrating how people see him as just a joke, and if that should lead him to quit and why he doesn't, and it just hit really hard. Please don't ask why. This is an issue I could come back to again and again. It's one of those lightning in a bottle moments where it manages to buck the trend and tell a smaller story within a bigger narrative, yet still give us enough and have humour, emotion, and character development that then tied back into the main plot. But of course, King just didn't know when to leave him be. He's not a mainstay by any means, but he shows up a handful of times and never does anything as important as his role in the war. And because this event had already taken place before the run started, it reinforced the fact that he was mostly just a joke petty criminal. So what was the point in all that character development? He was the first villain that Gotham Girl caught. He was a minor inconvenience to Batman before his wedding. That's how else he was used in this run, so why not just let him be? I have to stress this again, he's the first villain, the character who does barely anything in this run manages to catch. God, I'm in two minds with this series. Already, it feels like I've done a full video worth of script on this run, and I'm no wiser as to whether or not I even enjoyed it. And uncannily, almost as if King knew, every time I felt disappointed, something would happen that would pull me back in. Which is why I'm pleased to say that the Joelle Jones art and Natalia arc is phenomenal. If I'd have known she was on this, I'd have expected nothing less. I loved her work in Lady Killer, and it elevated the series here too. Don't get me wrong, Janin held his own during war, but this gave us a new style to look at. Because it was only for a few issues, I really enjoyed the storyline here as well. It didn't completely change the direction of the run, but it returned it to the cat -bat relationship and touched on Bruce's past, brought in questions about their potential to stick with each other this time, and had more wholesome, human moments with the rest of the Bat family. I liked how other opinions were brought into it. Just because Detective Comics was more about the family doesn't mean I want them out of this book, and their inclusion was never at the detriment of the main story. Thinking about it now, it was after war that the best stretch of issues happened for me, and none of it was ever trying to be a 
a big grand plot, but just build on the characters. And maybe that's the secret with King, it could be that his strength is more in developing people rather than a plot. And it makes sense when I think about Vision, and hearing the criticisms of Heroes in Crisis, and even what I liked and disliked about Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow. And there is no better example of this than the second annual. Yeah, normally I skip these type of issues, but thank god I didn't you, because this might be one of my favourite Batman stories that I've read in a good number of years. It had heart, character, a full story, depth, stood on its own, but also added some context to the main run. And once I finished it, I realised that this was like the Batman equivalent to the first 10 minutes of Op. Honestly, if they would have saved this until the last issue, it would have been the perfect ending, given the focus on the relationship between Selina and Bruce. I've gone back and read this again since finishing the run, and it just feels timeless. If I read this 20 years from now, I reckon I'd still love it, and the reason I knew I enjoyed it so much is because I didn't care where this sat in continuity. It's just great as a standalone. And all of that is without mentioning the beautiful art from Lee Weeks. He's a name that crops up a few times in this run, and has a style that I really enjoyed. It's simplistic but still detailed, his his backgrounds and layouts were expansive, and it was just the cherry on top of my favourite issue by King. It felt like all of the storylines leading up to issue 50 were solely focused on that relationship, and it was great to get away from the suicidal Batman and see how Selina softened him up. On top of that, we just got some fun character building stories. There was a great issue where they went on a double date with Clark and Lois, and that double speak technique was used perfectly here, and it didn't make me want to skip entire issues. Through his proposal to Selina, we got more insight on his relationship with Superman, and how he views it other connections in his life. Even with the man he considers his best friend, he's distant and closed off, similar to how it took years for the walls between Bruce and Selina to come down. I also like when Lois brought up Selina's history as a cat burglar, and that everyone hasn't forgotten about that, but through their actions you see the two form a connection. And over the next few stories, King manages to find many different ways to work to that same goal, and make me excited to see these two tie the knot. What he enjoyed best was how King strengthened their romance by separating them during the Wonder Woman storyline, and we learnt more about them being a couple with them not being together. Again, it was Joel Jones on the art, so of course, I wasn't going to forget this part too quickly. It confronted Bruce with temptation as he and Wonder Woman were separated from Earth, having to fight a war for decades. There is a moment where the two of them contemplate maybe, you know, and if it wasn't clear before, it is now. Because if that was me, she would not have to ask me twice. The things Wonder Woman must know that I don't would change me forever. I'd be going back to Selina as a new man, probably finally learning a third position, and we'd all be better for it. Primarily me. We tested the trust and honesty between Bruce and Selina, which is something that isn't touched on often in superhero comic couples. Except maybe Spider-Man. And by doing this, it just made them feel more authentic, even though they are in this bizarre world. And it was just nice that King took the time to analyse this area there relationship. I also just liked how badass the gentleman looked. There was also a one shot with a creepy orphan, which just furthered my belief that nothing good comes from having kids. And even though it didn't happen until later in this run, this storyline did come back around, so it stretched beyond just being a world building one off, whilst also being a cautionary tale of what Bruce possibly could have ended up being. To further that bond between Selena and Bruce, there was a great Poison Ivy story arc that did admittedly overstay its welcome. Again, it was a fun concept having Selina and Bruce be the only people on the planet besides Ivy that could communicate, and it also had an interesting conclusion that didn't just result in a big fight. It's also an example of what worked well in this run, and why I think the detractors shouldn't talk every issue with the same brush, when it is just a smaller story focusing on some aspect of a character and sprinkling in factors from the rest of the Batman universe, whether that be Ivy, Talia, Superman, or even Mr. Freeze later on. It worked really well as a self-contained story that contributed to a wider scope. It's when King tries to go bigger and tell a huge overarching story that I didn't enjoy it as much, and where the cracks were more obvious. Speaking of which, even when King tried to do a running joke, it wore thin. And it was due in the Ivy story that I got really bored with the, it's impossible but he's Batman joke, because King kept using that to explain away valid questions that other characters brought up. It's one of those things that's irritating and barely passable when debating with a friend, let alone in an actual incontinuity story. But moving on, I'm a booster gold fan, loved him during 52 and his follow on series and pretty much everything else that I mentioned in me where to start for him, but this one taught me that maybe it has to be Dan Jurgens writing him for me to enjoy it. It's annoying too because all the ingredients in this storyline are things that I normally enjoy, alternate dystopian universes, a murderous Batman, a desperate need to return the timeline to normal, and also Booster Gold, but for whatever reason it just didn't grab me here. Especially considering how quickly the wedding was coming up, it just felt like a bizarre decision to use three issues on this. And it 
would have been better placed after issue 50. I would have preferred more issues like the one before this, where it was Selina trying to find a dress, and it flashed back to her and Batman's history. I loved that, especially with the pages trading between Jones and Janin. Don't get me wrong, there were a few fun moments, and it would often go left when you thought it'd go right, and the costume Selina had was like Michelle Pfeiffer's, but just felt like another story arc that I'd lump with the others that were a massive missed opportunity. And by this point, that column is getting way more crowded than I'd like. And I wish I could say things got better in the storyline just before the wedding, but this may be the dullest Joker story I've ever read, and by quite a stretch. And if you've got a bingo sheet for phrases I keep using for story arcs in this run, then make sure you tick off, this could have been great, all the components were there and it couldn't stick the landing, because all of them are applicable here. Similar to the Booster Gold storyline, this was only a few issues and somehow King just couldn't get this across the finish line in a satisfying way. Maybe it was only meant to be one issue and King didn't realise that he needed to pad it out until the 50th, and especially with me opening this part with the War of Jokes and Riddles, it's fitting that I'd close this chapter out with another disappointing Joker story. Given that it was set up like a bottle episode, I thought this would be the chance where King really gets to say something about Batman and the Joker. But instead, they just lie on the floor of a church and wait for death. Its symbolism there is way too on the nose, but it still goes for it, and it tries way too hard with the humour between Joker and Catwoman. Sure, it's fitting that their last act before the wedding involves a villain that's so interlinked in Batman's lore that he would feel somewhat jealous that Bruce is getting married, but if that was the story that he wanted to tell, he could have done it in a more entertaining way than this. And that could have been my summary of this part, despite a few glimmers of greatness here and there. The worst part about that, this was the prime of this run for me. This should have been my final verdict, but for whatever reason, this run didn't end at issue 50 when it really, really should have. How fitting would that have been if the issue that chronicled their lives together through letters to one another was the concluding chapter for a story that revolves around Bruce and Selina? Although admittedly, the two talk about eyes more than Stephen King talks about Maine. But this issue was also beautifully punctuated by amazing pinups from a variety of different artists, even if one of them was modern Frank Miller, and I was forced to remember the abomination that is DK2. The setup was there for this to cross the finish line as well, because the couple, after 25 issues of build-up, decide instead to ditch the theatrics and have a quiet ceremony on a rooftop, able to fully embrace both sides of their lives that would now become one. They conveniently find a drunk judge who wouldn't be able to remember their identities and therefore probably means that the marriage wasn't legally binding anyway, but still, it's the sentiment of it. Had this been the final issue, which it felt like it'd been building to, probably more so if you spent the year waiting for this in single issues, I'd probably be sat here and saying that this one isn't perfect, but it achieved what King wanted to accomplish. But unfortunately, that's not the case. In the final pages of issue 50, King completely unravels the knot he'd been tying, along with the one that Selina and Bruce were supposed to. And I can't help but get my tinfoil hat on and theorise that this may have been where he originally wanted to end his run, but for whatever reason, just didn't. It wasn't completely out of the blue, because the best man's storyline planted the seed in Selina's head that Bruce couldn't be happy if he wanted to be an effective Batman, which would carry far more weight if it was coming from anyone other than an insane clown who is known to enjoy messing with people's heads. But regardless, Selina left Bruce on their wedding day, something that I'll talk more about in part 4, but it does conveniently explain away how at least the villains of them knew that Batman and Catwoman were getting married which must somehow eventually lead to their secret identities getting out. But if I wanted a well thought out run, I'd have to read something else. Although I won't sit here and act like there wasn't still some promise. The Cold Days Trial of Mr. Freeze was really enjoyable, and the art from Lee Weeks was one of my favourites. I know I spoke about his work during the second annual, but I started playing Sifu recently, and his style just really reminds me of that look. It's got this sketch-like quality to it while still being clean and detailed, with there being a few times where it harkens back to classic Batman artists like Mazzuchelli. And I I loved it. The story worked well too, and I think it's mostly because it had the right villain. Mr. Freeze is a character who it's very easy to be empathetic towards, and everything about him is in that morally grey area. This was one of those arcs where it felt as if King knew what he had in mind from the beginning. As well, going back to that strength in the character based moments, it was great having this as a more Bruce focused story. And he was given agency as Bruce Wayne outside of anything to do with Wayne Enterprises. As well, it forced him to separate the two parts of his life and have him analyse the way he goes about his vision anti crusade. And you know what? Despite the intro, the story arc after this was great too, and it was misdirection in the best way. But don't worry, the worst way's also coming up, just to balance things out. It started with this issue that I thought was going to be a one shot about Batman's relationship with Nightwing. At first, I thought this was an annual, and I just hadn't checked the front cover, and it was just great to see Matt Wagner working on a book again. Although, yeah, it was on the nose, I didn't mind it drawing so many parallels to Bruce and his own father. But when KG Beast entered the story, it made sense why King used an issue to stress 
stress the importance of Bruce and Dick. Getting to see this relentless, tenacious side to Bruce was great as well. Once Nightwing had been targeted, he was like a Terminator, and it reinforced the idea that knowing that Batman is coming for you is far worse than just knowing he's out there. Those scenes of Batman walking through the snow were paced so well, and I think this was part fallout for what happened to Dick, and part Bruce just going to the ends of the earth to distract himself from what happened with Selina. There was a lot to enjoy here, and I had a great time with it. Although, let's just gloss over the whole battle with the mummy invasion at the beginning though, because I'm trying to be positive about this part. Although, it's during this part when Tom King really becomes... Tom King. What I mean by that is that subtext and symbolism becomes more important than the story he's telling. There's a Russian fairy tale about a fox and other animals that becomes morbidly dark very quickly, and it's okay and kind of enjoyable the first time it's referenced, especially for setting the tone and giving you some context into KG Beast but also comes back later on and for no real reason other than for the reader to go, oh, this was that story from earlier. Like is King attempting to have his own pirate part of Watchmen here? And I'm genuinely asking there because I always skip the pirate part. When this one was coming out, I remember discussion when one of the main editors left and people contributing that to the reason why the wheels really came off the car. And I can't remember the specific issue that happened, but I guess it must have been around here because everything good is met with a bigger example of King getting in his own way. Another example, there's a great issue following the Penguin and he ticks all the boxes of everything I enjoyed so far. But then in the very next issue, Bruce actually says, say your name is Bane so I can tell you I'm Batman. There is a company on this planet that actually paid someone to write those words in the script. There must have been ample people who read this book before it was published and not one of them stopped that line from making print. And it's the perfect example of what YouTube taught me best, that everything around something can be spot on, but that one mistake will be the only thing that people remember. Because Batman breaking into Arkham, going through Gore Gordon and taking it straight to Bane was top tier for this run. I thought this was going to be one of the best issues of this series. The flashbacks to the meeting with Penguin was the cherry on top, but if you ask me to name one thing from this issue, it's that dumb line. Again, the annual was a clear highlight, it was the one about Alfred and it was just so wholesome, but overshadowed by the fact that a hit had been called out on him in the issue before. So it didn't feel like a coincidence and as if this was a preemptive obituary, so it really took the shine off what was a great issue. But the strong promise shown at the start and trickled throughout this part came to a grinding halt with the Nightmare arc. This was one of those ideas that overstayed its welcome by the third issue and is a microcosm of what I don't enjoy about King's time on Batman. Sure, it did a solid job of bringing storylines back that had begun earlier in the run and making it all feel connected, like the kid who wanted to be Bruce Wayne and acted as a showcase for some of Batman's other villains that don't get much time in the spotlight. But it tried so hard to get me to care about what was going on with Bruce noticing that things weren't right. We could have just had a creepy Professor Pig storyline or a cool Constantine plot, but all of it is tainted by these final pages that all but confirm none of it is real. Yeah, don't get me wrong, it was cool that they were bringing in a lot of different artists, but if anything, that that just made me hate the storyline more because that was completely wasted potential. Worse so, this arc felt longer because there was another Flash crossover slotted in part way through. So is this also part of the nightmare sequence? Did this happen before and King just got ahead of his own pacing? Why wait this long to bring Gotham and Gotham Girl back into the picture for a storyline that is more about Flash than the Batman who introduced these two characters in the first place? What on earth was it supposed to achieve by slotting this in the middle of nightmares? And I know this wasn't written by King, but still, I don't like to read it head because 9 times out of 10 I end up spoiling something for myself, but there was a point where I genuinely wondered if this would be the rest of the run until it ends. Another thing that irked me is it dampened one of the best issues, and that was the one with the bachelorette party. It was so light and fun, and even though it felt out of place, I don't mind because it was just so enjoyable. Yeah, I asked myself pretty early what was going on because Bruce and Selina had split up, but then I saw Amanda Connor on the art, and I didn't care. This could have been a flashback issue, but I didn't mind because it returned me to the part of the run that I really enjoyed. But then because because of nightmares, all of the questions start coming in. Did this actually happen and we're just getting to experience it for the first time? If so, how did Batman know what Selina was doing whilst he wasn't there? Was this just a hallucination? And I really hope it isn't because I loved the scene of Bruce and Clark having an awkward boring dinner together. But then it clicked for me. Maybe that was King's point with nightmares. With it being nearly as long as the war of jokes and riddles and setting up what would become the final part, it's clear that King wanted to do something here and maybe just got lost in the final product. Nightmares does make you question well, 
everything. And even though the Flash crossover in the middle caused more problems than it solved, when it came back to this storyline, there was that false sense of security that maybe things had returned to normal, especially with how the narrative could jump forward and back throughout this run. Damn, maybe this is just King doing one division. To sum it up, I think the idea behind it isn't a bad one, and connecting it to aspects I enjoyed in earlier issues, like the other Bruce Wayne, the friendship of Selina and Lois, and the abandoned marriage made it feel like it was an integral part of King's overall storyline, more so towards the end when Bane and Thomas Wayne enter the picture and give some context towards what's happening, but overall it just felt like it didn't accomplish what it set out to do, and was trying to take a shortcut to tell all these different storylines without needing to give them a full arc. Why were we only given one issue for those stories, and we're not even sure if they were real? I can't fault the ambition of trying something different, and to book the narrative trend established so far, but Nightmares in the end was a confusing mess that only highlighted the fact that King lost vision of what this run was about. Bruce and Selina, and I think that's evident from how much he crams them into the last few issues. And I also think that's the main reason why I wasn't a huge fan of this stage of the series. It occasionally touches base with them, but by incapacitating Batman for the whole of this storyline, there wasn't much to learn about them. Unfortunately, Nightmare sets up the final part of King's time on Batman and sets a tone for it as well. And fair warning, I ain't happy about it. Regardless of what I'm about to say about the final act of Tom King's run on Batman, it's clear that there was a story here that you wanted to tell. It's just unfortunate that the story was a meandering mess that featured a mostly naked Bane. Straight out the gate, we're subjected to the fall and the fallen, and I know which one I was after just a few issues of this. Once again, Batman is able to just Batman his way out of a situation because he manages to escape the torture trap that he was in. At least King saves us the cringe of having somebody explain it away by saying, because he's Batman, but that's the only reason I can find and King's conditioned me to just believe that that's the case. His rampage through Arkham is entertaining to look at, until I thought about it for a few seconds and asked how any of this was possible. Was this part of continuity, a flashback, another nightmare sequence? If King wanted us to feel the confusion Bruce would have, then that sort of makes sense, but if Batman was able to get himself out of that trap, then he knows more than the reader does as to what on earth was going on. Annoyingly as well, King used this first issue to do something similar to what he did with Kite Man, and kind of undid all of the good work that he did with Mr. Freeze earlier by making him just another enemy that Batman has to go through. And I don't know if it was just me, but this made me feel bad for Victor. And annoyingly, another thing that I'd previously praised came back to haunt me in this issue as well, as having two artists working on alternate pages and telling different yet mirrored stories may have looked beautiful thanks to the contrasting styles but it didn't help provide any clarity on what the hell was even going on. This confusion tactic may just be me being a dumb reader and I am fully ready to accept that, but I can't imagine I was alone in this feeling. And it's a good technique to use in small doses, but this feeling of constant disruption had been going on for over 10 issues now and didn't show any signs of slowing down. It was as if King played the scarecrow parts of Arkham Asylum the night before and just wanted to do a comic version of that but didn't take the time to make it work. And before people start commenting, I know it was part of Bane's plan to break the Batman but it just feels like that's done more through confusing the reader rather than having a plan that makes sense. Like I can't fathom how Batman is smart enough to break out of this nightmares machine but still doesn't really know what's happening. Did Morpheus just pop up and offer him a red pill because I swear that made more sense than the Matrix. It's tricky as well because this was clearly Bane's intention from those very early issues, and there have been countless scenes where someone has spoken to Bane, and it's clear that his influence stretches further than a cell in Arkham, even if the Kingpin did that concept better. But on the other hand, it's more annoying because King had been planting these seeds for so long. How was it that he knew Bane would be the overarching villain and the groundwork had been laid, but then not be able to coherently deliver the climax of that? Did he just sneak up on him that his run was ending? Where so, the fall and the fall and did little to get me excited for the city of Bane, and I went into it with more questions than I knew would be answered in the time we had left. And if you've watched this channel before, you might already be aware that I'm a big Flashpoint apologist, even more so when I reviewed it last year, and the best part about that was the Thomas Wayne Batman, but this run, and in particular everything after Nightmares, made me realise that sometimes you can have too much of a good thing. That issue when he and Bruce were in the desert and duking it out, it was fun, and the whole you can only be my son line really gave insight into his motivation and mentality, but you should still realise that this isn't the same son that you lost. Him trying to stop Bruce from being Batman is no more valid than if 
if Bruce tried to stop him from doing it. I get that Thomas couldn't control which time he entered, but you should realise at this stage that Bruce has been doing this for way too long to give up just because a murderous version of his dad tells him to. He's far from the best reference when it comes to rational decisions. I think this would have worked far better had this been a separate story, and maybe soon after he was reintroduced in the button. Although Thomas Batman's hardly a virtuous hero, I can't see him having such a strong desire to stop a version of his son that he would team up with Bane and an army of villains. Was that honestly the only course of action he could see working? What was his plan after this because he must assume now that there's other versions of his son in different universes? Again, the themes here of loss and trying to correct the past and finding a purpose in life versus just doing what we're told to do, all of that is great and has potential but King is far more focused on a confusing mess of a larger plot for any of those themes to be fully explored. And also I'm just thinking on the fly here but why did they think a fight against a different version of his dad in the desert would be more effective than that nightmare machine that was built to destroy him? If anything not having Thomas Wayne in this would have meant that some of the biggest nonsensical parts of this conclusion would probably be explained better. Like let me see if I've got this right because if all Thomas truly wanted was for Bruce to be happy then why have Alfred killed? Why take him to the desert and beat him up? Why not instead just look after Gotham so that Bruce can retire? Why beat up Damien? This was the same guy who in Flashpoint was willing to sacrifice himself if it meant that a version of his son could still exist. But Thomas Wayne is far from the biggest problem with City of Bane. For starters, we spend far too much time away from the City of Bane. Because of this and the way the narrative was structured, I am ashamed to admit that it took me two issues just to realise that this wasn't another alternate universe story. It's also where my criticisms of the earlier Bane arcs come back to haunt this series. Although we've seen him working in the shadows, recruiting different villains, calling out hits on members of the Bat family and putting everything in motion, he should have had much more of a presence in the mid part of this run. Or at least use some of the time that was spent dragging out nightmares, the fall and the fallen and that flash crossover to instead show us how Bane really ushered in his reign. How did he manage to take over? Why didn't we get to see an attempt from the GCPD or any other heroes to try and stop this? Even if they're not Batman, they've been trained under him and they couldn't think of one way to get Get around Bane? We don't even get told how long this took and just get a page saying later, like can we all get away with being that vague? Should I have not wrote 20 pages on this run and just told it to do better? You know what, I'm gonna do this book a favour and I'm just gonna assume that I checked out at this point and wasn't paying enough attention for these answers. It wouldn't be the first time. But I honestly think this could have worked if it was given additional time because Joker and Riddler being a detective duo under the guidance of Hugo Strange? Sign me up. Flashpoint Batman giving Gotham Girl a bit of purpose in this run? I'm all for it, but not if you cut every corner and still expect me to believe this is in continuity. Like this gave me the vibe that King wanted to do the Batman Flashpoint tie-in years ago and didn't get the chance, so instead just said fuck it and used the concept as a closing arc for his regular run. And whilst I was reading it, I was trying to figure out why that's the case, and I think it's because King can become too fixated on an idea, or sometimes a genre, and won't really care for the explanation or the collateral damage. We saw it in Supergirl where he wanted to do a space western, even if it didn't feel like we were following Kara. Vision was a kind of psychological thriller that I didn't realise until a few issues in was actually set within the 616 universe. And City of Bane is like a dystopian version of every cliche 80s action movie. Which yeah, on paper does sound great, but just didn't work as a conclusion to what had been set up before. Annoyingly, this premise would have worked better if it had taken more note from those movies and just threw us into this world from the very beginning. Treat it like an Elseworld title and don't give me 74 issues before to see the pieces coming together, but then leave the majority of them out. We probably would have brushed away the more random elements like Bruce Wayne being out of the picture and Flashpoint Batman being in Gotham, but instead it felt like there was a massive leap from the setup to the execution. And having recently gone back to Old Man Logan and really enjoying how they just threw us into the world and then gave us backstory as it went on, King could have done something similar here, but unfortunately we just don't spend a lot of time within the Gotham that Bane cultivated. For the motive of using this premise to bring the bat and the cat together, it's fine I guess, but it just gave me the sense that King wasn't happy with how he set up their romance the first time and took the final arc to try again, even though it worked better and felt more natural the first time. Because of the arbitrary decision to split them up at issue 50, time has to be wasted in the final arc to bring them back. But at the same time, I felt none the wiser as to why they really needed to split up in the first place. King finds a way to just blame it on Bane and say it's part of his master plan, but... 
Come on. We even saw Selena going out and stealing a wedding dress. Was that part of Bane's plan as well? King even wasted an entire issue explaining how absolutely everything that's happened in this run, even the plane crashing at the beginning, and Catwoman coming back into his life, and Bruce proposing to Selena, and I don't know how Bane would have planned for that one. Like, is Bruce also in this plan to break the Batman? A plan which was done far more efficiently by the exact same villain in Nightfall. By chalking it up as just another pawn in Bane's giant game, it begs the question, why should we ever trust her again? Huh, maybe Lois was right on that double date. King does at least have a few conversations where it's clear that there's that unease between the two of them, but this just makes Bruce look even more dumb because he does eventually trust her again. Well, at least, if nothing else, the two got a holiday together out of it. Yep, whilst Bane is destroying Gotham, Bruce and Selina jet around the world, at one stage to a beach that seems to remove all of Bruce's scars he's accumulated from crime fighting. So if King wanted this finale to feel tense, or that there was some sense of urgency, this was quite possibly the worst way to do it. But I did like Bruce's little Magnum PI disguise. And pacing is something I've touched on throughout this run, but City of Bane just does not nail it. Beyond giving Cat and Bat a vacation, the trope of most issues being overly narrated is still present. And it's no less irritating. And there is no sense behind the order of scenes either. One issue opens with a full page spread of Selina, letting us know she's on a rooftop in Paris, saying meow to either no one or someone we can't see. Then the very next page is a fight between Captain Atom and Gotham Girl. So what was the point in the Catwoman page? Why not just wait till we've got to that scene? At least the Captain Atom scene clued us into the fact that the president has executed an order forbidding any heroes from entering Gotham? What? How did this happen? Is Bane holding the president's butler hostage as well? And why did they send one of the heroes who doesn't agree with the order into Gotham to tell them that it's been given? Is the president aware now that there's two different Batmen and that this one isn't a hero? Is Gotham Girl now officially designated as a villain? Why ban superheroes and not supervillains? What are the rules for the residents of Gotham? Why would this be enough to stop anyone from breaking into Gotham? Tim Drake did it off his own back whilst he was still robbing you in No Man's Land. At this stage in the run, it just felt as if King was taking the easiest option out of every situation to just get his version of the story over the line. And what's his version of the story? Well, have you ever watched The Dark Knight Rises? If so, then you've seen the template that King used. Away from Gotham, a Batman who has been psychologically and physically broken by Bane has to find it within himself, with the help of Catwoman, to become the Dark Knight once again and take back his city. It even looks like they go to the same cafe in Paris. At least if they are in Paris or anywhere else in the EU, and Bruce needs some books to get him through this difficult time, and he wants free shipping and free gifts with every order, then the only place he should go is Comics Bugle. They've been a massive support to this channel, and they can be to you as well, because because if you use code woof woof, you can get 3% off all books that aren't already in a sale. So get your orders in. It's far from original, but King could have at least tried to make it more entertaining here. With all the time it wastes bringing Selina back to Bruce and her helping him find his will again, it feels like treading water when I'd have much preferred to have drowned. But I have no idea how Bruce could be so naive, because if that was me, I'd... <laughs> um, I'd never be able to trust her again because... be back in a minute. But one of my biggest problems is that I don't even fully buy how Selina brought Bruce back around. But apparently Bruce, or maybe Selina stole one at some point, has a pristine version of his suit lying around that must have been smuggled through somehow when they went through customs to get through to all these different places. And it makes no sense why Bruce would be the one to take it because apparently he was too broken to be Batman. But yeah, apparently all it takes is he and Selina suiting up, they climb one mountain, jump off it, catch one batarang, reenact the beach scene that Rocky and Adrian had after he lost a club of lang, stop some deal going on on a boat and BAM! Good enough to stop Bane. Because there was such a poor sense of time passing, this either makes it look like Bruce was really overreacting, or Bane didn't do that much damage in the first place. It may have actually been more beneficial to never have a recovery phase. Have a Batman that's lost everything, is mentally and physically broken, but still have to find a way out. That shouldn't be impossible in a run that brushes away everything with because he's Batman. And that idea could have worked better to some degree, especially if it was Bruce that had to watch Alfred getting his neck snapped. Additionally, wasn't Alfred Bane's main bargain chip to stop the Bat family moving in on him. I hate when I read one of these storylines that's so unnecessarily convoluted that I can't figure out if I'm just being dumb. Because I like to know I am. At least, if nothing else, there's decent art from Tony S. Daniel to help this get over the finish line. Especially in a lineup that included Finch, Janine, Jones, Weeks, and a few others. It's nice that the art can remain consistently high until the end. Ah oh crap, I forgot about John Romita Jr. being on this. Sure, yeah, art is subjective and there are going to be people who like this, but it's also really jarring when you go from big dynamic styles to this flat 2D 
the loot that Ramita Jr. brings. It's fitting as well, since it felt like King was half arsing this, that they have the artist who completely ditched his once great Luke as soon as he became a big name. That fight where the Bat Family teams up against Thomas Wayne, if it had looked better, I probably wouldn't have thought as much about how dumb it was that Thomas Wayne found a way to take them all down, and they didn't bother to show how. During a time when Thomas Wayne was already weakened, and would have struggled in a 1v1 against Nightwing. And me going in on modern day Ramita Jr. doesn't take away from the great work he did in the 80s and 90s on titles like Daredevil, and even his time on Kick-Ass looked better than this. But I think if there was one way to perfectly symbolise how sharply my feelings for this run changed, then look no further than going from Tony Daniels to John Ramita Jr. I'm going to apologise as well if you've made it this far in the video, because it probably feels like you've got whiplash with how I dart between topics. But it's because there's just so much thrown into this final part, and very little finesse is displayed to make it feel cohesive. Because Johnny returns on the run to give us another moment that felt badass the first time I read it, but then once again fell apart as soon as I thought about it. And yep, it's the beginning of issue 82 with the no masks confrontation between Batman and Bane. If you thought me saying this was an 80s action movie sounded dumb before, then explain away why this moment is in here. As far as final fights go, this one is okay, but I think the setup was done far better during I Am Bane. And the trope of characters needing to announce who they are, even though both of them were unmasked at this point, just felt juvenile. Going with the overarching relationship of the bat and the cat, it was nice to see Bruce take a page out of Selina's book and break the rules he and Bane had set up for their fight. But there's something a bit lackluster if in the final fight, Batman still needs help to beat Bane. Although, I guess it's showing how he has faith in her again and how he needs her to overcome the demons in his life. I don't know, something just felt underwhelming by having this as the final showdown. But yep, just when I thought we were done with him, Thomas Wayne comes back in. And I felt this completely neutered the handful of things that were good about the final fight with Bane. Because once again, it's King just doing what he wants, rather than what services the story best. Why, when we were only a few issues from the end, did we need another pace break to have Bruce traipsing around the manor? We also have Alfred narrating a story after Bruce finally learns that he's dead because God forbid we get a quiet moment in this, and only gets a few pages to react before needing to resume with the plot. Alfred's death should be the most important thing that's ever happened in his life, only second to his own parents being killed. He was the only person Bruce trusted enough to be his witness when he was going to get married, although he didn't want him as his best man. Bit harsh. But for some reason, Alfred's brutal death was nothing more than a shock scene to end an issue that didn't add much to Bane's overall plan to crush Bruce. Because Bane was already out of the picture by the time Bruce knew that Alfred was dead, only for Catwoman to come in and then lead Batman to Thomas Wayne. Like, you were already in front of him in the last issue when he was fighting Bane, so was all this in the manor also done so his son could be happy? And also because we've got no gauge of time, like, how bad must Alfred have stunk? How didn't that wake Bruce up? Worse so, the cliche of Bane was behind everything, more sent to a Thomas Wayne was there for everything after the button trope, and it just felt like King was wasting too much time trying to connect everything together, but ensuring to do it in the most disappointing way. Again, everything in this penultimate issue is just listed as taking place earlier, so that King doesn't have to properly care about the timeline. I'm all for a decent switcheroo in a surprise third act villain, but City of Bane ended up just being the vendetta of Thomas, and wasted what was a potentially exciting conclusion if it had just been thought out better. And I spoke in part 3 about how I thought that King may have wanted to end the series at issue 50, but that was my in the moment thought. Because when I got to the 85th and final issue, it felt like King was just desperately trying to undo all the mess that he'd set up. Even the stuff in the few issues before this. The city of Bane seems to just return to regular Gotham City because Batman fights his dad in Wayne Manor, with no real comment on how difficult it must have been to get things back under control again. Unless I really missed something crucial in this, and all of City of Bane was just another vision whilst Bruce was in the Nightmare Machine. That would have been annoying, but at least it makes sense. Bane gets his revenge on Thomas Wayne, and apparently hasn't been affected by being shot in the head, because... The Arkham Infirmary must have, like, the most powerful bandages on the planet. Bruce and Selina get back together, but seem to gloss over the whole getting married thing, and Cat also walking out on him in the past, even though their dynamic is fairly similar to what it was the first time they got together, so why wouldn't he believe that this might happen again? It's all good though, it's clear King took this approach and the oversized final issue so that we could finally get the moment we all wanted. Bruce watching a football game with Chuck Brown. Yes, it took until the last issue, but our prayers were finally answered. As Batman and Kite Man get to sit down as people, and the scenes that deal with the actual plot just get in the way of this moment that we'd all been begging for. Honestly, what was King hoping to achieve with this? Does the commentary of the football game that's littered throughout this issue add anything to the storyline with Thomas Wayne? Wayne, 
Bane, Bruce or Selina. Had this Kite Man moment been a short story in an annual, it could have been sweet because the message of there's still always been a chance is really wholesome, especially with what we learned of Kite Man earlier in the run, but it's nonsensical why King thinks this is important enough to be the backbone of the final issue, and it just comes across as pretentious. And it only adds to the problem of there being no clear sense of time. Does this happen before or after Bruce and Selina say they love each other? Had the city of Bane already been and gone by this point? Or had Kite Man already redeemed himself during the War of Jokes and Riddles? And it's annoying because none of these questions add anything to the experience because the scene everything is centred around is so minor. I could have possibly given King a pass if he'd at least ended this on a high, but the final issue, an entire final arc, left me feeling deflated and just ready for the series to end. But for better or worse, that was Tom King's run on Batman. Sure, there's the Batman and Catwoman series, but that came out separately, so I want to treat it as such for now, and I probably could keep talking about the main run, but I feel like I've been recording this for weeks now. Every time I thought I'd said everything I wanted to, it would remind me of something else I wanted to say. And thinking about the run as a whole is difficult because it's such a rollercoaster experience. There's clear highs, especially when it comes to the more character-focused moments, but the lows just seem to come more often the longer the run goes on. I get why people dislike this run, especially if you're asked to summarise a whole 85 or so issues, but I also get how that can seem a bit extreme and unfair if you're currently reading it. There is that constant sense that something is going to happen to get things back on track. And for as much as I've spent a lot of this video bagging on the majority of this, there was rarely a time where I struggled to get through an issue, or have that feeling that I couldn't be bothered to see it through to the end. So credit where it's due because I definitely can't say the same for the recent big run that I'm currently reading. This is my final verdict. And if Harvey Dent was to write a run on Batman, it would be pretty close to what Tom King gave us with these 85 issues. On one hand, it's an intriguing deep dive into Bruce Wayne and his relationships with family, villains, the love of his life, and his own love for life. But on the other hand, it's often a confusing mess that cuts corners, doesn't care about the pacing and makes baffling decisions with the characters with very little explanation. But at the same time, whether you're going to love it or hate it, I think it deserves to be read. For all its faults, King commits to whatever his vision is in that moment, so it's not surprising that in some instances it succeeds, but then in others it fails. There are a ton of missed opportunities here, especially when looking at the War of Jokes and Riddles, and definitely in the final few arcs with Nightmares, The Fallen, The Fallen, and City of Bane, all of which left me feeling deflated and frustrated but for completely different reasons. Whereas I Am Suicide, I Am Bane, everything in the run up to the wedding, and the phenomenal second annual prove that sometimes King can strike it right. And even when it's at its worst, it's almost in that entertainingly bad category, and rarely strays into being boring. And even if you're not enjoying the story, the art is so varied and consistently high throughout that you're probably still going to enjoy what you're looking at, unless you're me where there was one notable exception. This run is divisive, and it's easy to see why, but sometimes that reaction is is better than having no reaction at all. I can't imagine there are many people that wouldn't have something to say after finishing this. And sure, there are some storylines that do feel like the copying ones that have come before and aren't even done better by King, but the advancement he attempts with Bruce and Selina, along with trying to cut through to the core of why Batman is Batman, can make the repetition of unfunny running jokes and weak attempts at subtext be a bit more bearable. And even the inconsistent characterization of some characters isn't done nearly as bad as it is in other King books. And honestly, this is a run that I probably could have spent another hour talking about, so in some ways King must have succeeded at something. I just honestly don't have the mental capacity to figure out what that is. But if I had to do the difficult task of summing up Tom King's run on Batman in one sentence, It will delight others and infuriate the rest, but regardless, I think everybody should try it, because for better or worse, you're gonna have an opinion on it. And yeah, despite everything I've said about it, I'd still buy an omnibus.